Okay, we'll shortly be moving on to our plenary session on innovations in climate finance to achieve scale, speed, and impact. So this follows on very sweetly from what Nick Stern was talking about. This is finance as an enabler and how finance can be an enabler and not an obstacle when it comes to pulling together the resources that we need to tackle climate change and to unite prosperity with a low carbon economy. Um, now, if I can invite the panel on stage, um, we're going to invite uh, Ms. Priti Bandari, who is Director of the Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management Division in the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department of the Asian Development Bank. And we're going to invite Mr. Ivo de Boer, who's President of the Gold Standard Foundation, Mr. H.R. Dave, Deputy Managing Director of the National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development here in India, Mr. John Room, who's Senior Director of Climate Change of the World Bank, and Ms. Lars Tubiana, who's CEO of the European Climate Foundation. And they're going to be joined by our Chair, Mr. Deepak Dasgupta, who's a distinguished fellow at Terry. So please join me welcoming the panel onto the stage. So Ms. Bandari is joining us shortly, I hope. Yeah. So Mr. Dasgupta, can I hand over to you to chair proceedings? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a tough act to follow when you just heard Nick Stern talking about climate finance. But this session, we are going to expand on what he's been talking about, which is about creating more space to get more high quality finance, both volume, speed, and innovations that we need in order to achieve the goals that we have. So we really truly have a very distinguished panel. Each of the speakers will speak for about five minutes, and I'll introduce them as they're uh, uh, in the kind of agreed position that we did. And then we will turn to a Q&A and make it a little bit more interactive. Now, uh, I'll start with John Room. So he is he, you're most welcome to use the podium or speak from, I think the podium is the most, podium? or wh whichever one you wish. John Room is Senior Director for Climate Change at the World Bank. He joined the bank in 89, uh, worked initially in Africa and various other places. And he has been in, uh, in several regions of the bank and uh, experience spanning pretty much across the globe and across sectors. And he was earlier at Oxford University and at the University of Cape Town. John. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deepak. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me maybe start by saying what Nina and Nick said as the starting point. From Nina's point, from our perspective, development and climate completely interrelated. If we get it wrong, you get 100 million more people in poverty, 140 million more migrants. If you get it right, $26 billion, trillion dollars of additional uh, economic growth, 67 million extra jobs. The challenge is huge. To reiterate what Nick said, the scale and the urgency is important. So what does this mean for finance? So at one level, from the World Bank Group's perspective, we're really committed to this. Last year, we put $20 billion of financing for climate action, double what we did the year before Paris. We met our Paris objectives two years ahead of schedule. And at COP in Katowice, we announced forward-looking 2021 to 2025, $200 billion of financing, double what we've done in the past five years. On the one hand, very proud of that. A lot of finances coming in, a lot of it enabled by some of the things that Nick talked about in terms of capital increase. We need to be able to put more money on the table. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is how we actually use that money and how we engage. And I want to talk about three things that are really important. First of all, enabling the private sector to make the investments. And there's two reasons why this is important. One, as Nick said, there's trillions of dollars sitting on the edge 
earning low rates of interest, if these could be put into low carbon resilient infrastructure, we'd have a huge pool of finance in order to address this. The problem at the moment is that the risk perception is too high. So we've got to find ways of crowding that money in. Second opportunity is that technology provides us a huge opportunity for low carbon and climate resilient development. But right now, a lot of these technological opportunities are not commercially viable, but they could be in the future. And here I'm thinking about batteries for storage. Here I'm thinking about energy efficiency cooling. I'm thinking about electric vehicles. It is quite possible that as these markets get developed over time, the private sector will be able to come in. The question is, is it going to take five or 10 years to develop these as fully commercial markets, or can we do it in two to three years? So what we'd be very focused on from the World Bank Group is how do we crowd in that private finance? And we've got lots of examples of how this has been done before. Here in India, to name just two, one ESL basically developed uh, the, the low energy efficiency light bulbs, created that market through public procurement, through small amounts of concessional finance, through various forms of support that's developed. The Madhya Pradesh Railway Renewable Energy Plant, by putting World Bank financing in to help structure the deal, do an off-take arrangements with uh, Delhi Metro, and putting in the core infrastructure, basically allowed the private sector to come in with bids for renewable energy that for the first time were grid parity with coal. These are the opportunities, I think, that we have in order to drive this. In order to do this, three areas we need to work. One is on the supply side, financial sector, regulations in the financial sector, disclosure in the financial sector, so that the finance institutions have the incentives to lend for this kind of investment. Second area on the demand side, creating demand through the NDCs, through policy reform at the country level, and then intermediation, de-risking opportunities. That's the first one, crowding in the private sector. Secondly, mainstreaming within government. In countries like India and around the world, the financing from the multilateral development banks, although significant, is very small relative to government expenditure that's going to take place. And so the second opportunity is how do we make all of that government expenditure much greener while still meeting the sustainable development goals? I had a very good discussion with our transport team today talking about rural transport here in India. Another very exam good example where they've changed road standards and the way in which rural roads are implemented here in India in ways that can simultaneously reduce the carbon emissions from the rural roads, make those roads more climate resilient, and reduce the costs of manufacturing those roads. But that doesn't happen automatically just because of an individual MDB project, but it comes by trying to mainstream this into government financing. A key part of this is going to be working with ministries of finance and planning to make certain that public procurement, budgeting, fiscal policies all incorporate climate considerations in order to drive forward. That's the second area. Th Before I talk about the third area, I just want to stress that we're not only talking about low carbon development here. We're also talking about climate resilient. Adaptation and resilience is critically important, the poorest are the ones that are going to develop. So while we talk about climate action, reducing those emissions is important, but incorporating private sector into adaptation and resilience, mainstreaming adaptation and resilience into government expenditure is as important as the mitigation side. Final area that's important from the MDB perspective is not just for us to do a certain percentage of our portfolio in climate, but to mainstream the Paris Agreement, the alignment with the Paris Agreement into everything that we're doing. So all of our investments will ultimately be aligned with Paris, and we're working together with the MDBs in order to drive this. I'd like to then go back to what, Paris, what, what Nick said about scale and urgency. A lot of these things that I've talked about is what will get us to scale. In terms of urgency, uh, what we think is very important is to create over the next three to five years confidence in developing countries and developed countries that these kinds of investments will allow us to meet low carbon objectives so that the next generation of NDCs are significantly more ambitious than the current one we have. And so building that confidence is absolutely key going forward, and it can only happen to develop this in partnership. All of the things that I've talked about cannot be done by one MDB alone, or private sector alone, or public sector alone. It's gonna be a question of how do we align 
action on behalf of MDBs, private banks, different kinds of institutional investors, policymakers, public sector, in a coordinated way. And so driving that partnership is absolutely critical. Thank you. Thanks, John. I think that's a great starting point uh, about getting a broad framework right for the speed and scale of climate finance. Uh, usually we think about mostly mitigation, reducing carbon emissions. Uh, while, we, while we are aware of the huge damages that are happening already on the ground through the climate global warming effects. And so uh, in India especially, when, we, when I think about what are the challenges and priorities ahead, uh, equal to the renewable objectives that we set out, equal to the energy efficiency side of the story, is how communities are responding and how communities are adapting. One of the key change agents there for a long time is, of course, NABAD, and we are very happy that Mr. Dave is here with us. And he's, go he has, he's the deputy managing director of NABAD, and and prior to that, he was also in various places within NABARD, running the institute's think tanks. And uh, he, was, he is an alumnus of the Indian School of Management, Ahmedabad. Mr. Davi, please. So good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Moving down from the international perspective, which has been given by Sururi, to the domestic one. And as Mr. Das Gupta just mentioned, while we talk of climate action, huge action is required on the adaptation side. And adaptation is one area where we, we need to talk about three capitals. One the public capital, the second is private capital, and third is the social capital. Unless we talk of convergence of these three capitals, we won't be able to have major impact on the adaptation. I represent the development bank of the nation for rural India, and we have been into the adaptation space for a long time. When we realize that uh, there is uh, demand you know, being restored on NABARD for emerging as local champion for climate action, we, we had our own consultations and, you know, consultations with Government of India, and uh, a lot of advice we received from all the stakeholders. The philosophy on which NABARD's climate finance revolves around is one, two, and three. One, we must be able to build convergence of resources because the kind of money which India needs, whether it is on adaptation or on mitigation, none of us together have it. It's a huge money which is required to be brought into Indian climate action. So where is this money then? While we are the accredited entity for Green Climate Fund, UNFCC promoted adaptation fund, country's local domestic adaptation fund, and NABAD has also set up its own climate fund from its own profits. But that's not enough to even talk about what is required to be done in India. And if you all believe that time is running out, we'll have to quickly work out mechanisms, and that's precisely what we are doing, where we build convergence of resources. I'll just give an example which defines the way we look at uh, actions. When Honorable Prime Minister was the Chief Minister of Gujarat, and he says that you know, a lot of IIT students are coming to us and asking me that you have a huge canal network, and why, why don't you put canal network on the solar? So the first canal top solar was funded by NABARD with blended finance. So one of the innovation which we came across is that while we are willing to put in money, but this is a new and innovative thing, and which, which is a huge potential for scale up, would government of Gujarat like to put in some money from their side? They, they willingly do need that, and the, it set the example, number one. Number two, let's look at the two major players who have the resources. One is the Indian banking system, and the other is the government system. 
we set up a climate change center with focus on climate finance, the first ever in Southeast Asia, at Bankers Institute for Rural Development, Lucknow, which is one of the premier training establishment of uh, Indian banks. The mandate is, number one, can you make the state government's budgets more greener? So can we establish the benchmark where today, government of Maharashtra stands here, you, you also touched upon this point, and can we set a roadmap for government of Maharashtra to move to next level in the you know, next three to four years? And the second pool of resources is available with the Indian banks. We are now working with every bank of India, trying to work out where do you stand when it comes to financing climate? And what kind of roadmap you need to build that's where India will be able to find resources. Getting international money is not always easy. Uh, das Gupta ji knows it very well. Uh, and the quantum which flows into India is also inadequate. Now, if that be the case, while we continue to encourage private sector, we also must be able to build convergence of resources. I think my time is up, so I'll stop here. Maybe later on I'll chip in with you a few more ideas. Thank you so much. So thank you, Mr. Davi. I, I, I think uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the two contrasts are clear. So you have a perspective from John Room as he looks at uh, the global picture, and he, he, he's talking about enabling the private sector, um, building structure of supply side, crowding it in. And on the other side, you just heard Mr. Davi talk about huge gap between what India's needs are relative to what the rest of the world is able or can provide, and how to bridge that gap within our own resources. And that's convergence, as he calls it. So uh, we will come to this in a question and a session. I think there's a lot of debate around any and all of these points. I don't want you to leave this <clears throat> hall thinking that we, have an, uh, that we agree with each other necessarily on all these points. And so it's a very live uh, issues of debate. So let me turn to another perspective, which is more from, I guess, uh, 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 a perspective of the analytical research side. How, what are we looking at? And I'm delighted to have Lawrence Tubiana is here. She's the CEO of the European Climate Foundation. In addition to her role at the ECF, she's the chair of the Board of Governors at the French Development Agency. And certainly, she'll be able to give us that development agency. And she's also a professor at Sciences Po. Uh, uh, without much ado, Lawrence. Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I'm, I'm a regular participant of the of this summit, and I, I'm really happy to see how much more now. Uh, uh, bringing from the principle and the vision, we are going more and more in the operational, and I'm, I'm really happy to see that evolution, and in particular, to see the change of the discussion in your country, in India. It's really impressive. And again, um, before Paris, where of course I happen to be the ambassador there to prepare for the Paris Agreement, and, and now the conversation in India has shifted totally on renewable energy, on electrification of transport, on uh, on, of course, uh, many other elements and even already trying to diversify the economy. It, it's really fascinating, businesses, banking sector, etc. So finance, of course, plays a very big role into the implementation of Paris Agreement, which I, of course, very concerned with. And, and finance at the COP24, and I, I see my good friend Thomas Koshov there representing the Polish government and, and as a presidency, the Polish government pushed that we have a good agreement on finance, which was, I think, we make progress on the transparency. And of course, we, we need to have some kind of previsibility of this finance. And I think that was a good achievement in the COP24 that at least all agree that we have a transparency on the commitments and the implementation of the mitigation action, on adaptation action as well. And at the same time that on finance, the same transparency system should really be implemented. And I think that's the condition of trust. We need to trust that everyone is, is really going in the same direction. 
So, uh, and, and you know, again, we see good news on the, I think there is a strong willingness to replenish the green climate fund. Uh, there, there was, of course, the same thing on the Adaptation Fund and Least Developed Countries Fund. Uh, John just announced a big announcement that World Bank has done. It was a very significant one to see that we can be really on track for the 100 billion if we continue the pressure. Of course, nothing is easy for, for 2020. <clears throat> but of course, still, I think it's good. And as John said, it's a problem of the system who has to change. If we want to move these trillions, we are still going into the fossil fuel economy, to the, to the low carbon economy that Nick was, Nick Stern was mentioning. Uh, we have to change the chain. It's, a, it's a not one actor, it's a whole chain of finance that has to be modified. That's why the element that again John mentioned, the alignment of the portfolio of all the institutions that are finally have this very clear goal in mind, uh, alignment of the Paris Agreement goal, which is really, uh, again, as Lord Stern mentioned, it's very tough. Uh, it's 40% uh, emission reduction by in the next uh, 20 years. It's about getting at net zero emission for most of the countries by 2050. So it's a not incremental transformation, it's a deep transformation. And if we want to go there, then we have to hold the financial system responding to it. And you know, sometimes it's long and People and the different actors are, in a way, putting the brakes, but we, we know that it can shift rapidly if the good incentive is in place. So that's why the alignment, and I'm, I'm very proud that the French Agency of Development has committed to be 100% on all its portfolio, Paris compatible, and, and John, World Bank, and the, all the MDBs are really working hard on, on creating this alignment and to try to have a, which will be a very clear signal, very important signal. Uh, the IDFC, the club of development banks are, are jointly committed to align with Paris Agreement. And this will, in a way, uh, it's a part of the chain. It's not the whole chain, but it's part of the chain because it gives confidence to the private sector that is still, in a way, putting, and I, I like John element, appreciation still the when I talk to institutional investors like big ones like BlackRock, BlackRock or others they see that this low carbon economy they consider it risky and riskier which is in a way paradox these days than the fossil fuel investment is so how we change their perception of risk is absolutely central and so that's why we need really one to give the positive incentive signals and on the other side, which is all the work about transparency and disclosure, to really make this perception shift totally. And it can be done because we see, I just take the example of Europe. Now you want, when you want to fund uh, a coal-based power plant in Europe, you begin to see very uh, huge difficulties to find the money for it. So again, transparency, disclosure will be a very, very important element. So, again, to give this signal that the chain has to move. I think it's a good way to track. We, we can't ask for government to be serious about their long-term strategy. Uh, if they want, they have to have clear investment plans, but then, of course, the whole chain again, the public sector, the private sector has to respond to it. And that's why we need for the incremental, the increase of the perspective of the contribution, the second round we are calling for, and by 2020, countries will come with, with probably new numbers or a 2050 vision. That will be, I think, the, the frameworks in which we all have to work together to finance it. Thank you, Laurence. So, uh, three speakers, and we have two very distinguished speakers to follow, and I'm really delighted to have Ivo de Borca and he needs little introduction from me because he was the person, uh, many say, was responsible for the $100 billion a year promise some time ago, or at least had an instrumental role behind it. And uh, he's, uh, in his capacity, he served uh, most recently, uh, he's the president of the Gold Standard Foundation, which is, which is working at certification to ensure maximum impact of climate action. He has been the Director General of the Global Green Growth Institute uh, for 2014 to 2016, and before that at KPMG, 
and most importantly, I guess, in a sense, retrospective sense, he was the executive secretary of the UNFC, Triple C, uh, Evo Yor. Thank you, Deepak, for that introduction, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be at my 23rd uh, Delhi Sustainable <laughs> Development Summit. I can proudly say that I've never missed a single <laughs> one, and I've enjoyed them all immensely. Um, the, this session goes under the title Scale, Speed, and Impact of Finance, and I would like to talk about impact. Because if you spend a huge amount of money incredibly fast on all the wrong things, what's the point? At the end of the day, it's, uh, it's impact that, uh, that matters. In one of the panel sessions that I attended yesterday, I heard somebody say that if you take all of the triple A rated projects that are out there in the world, one in 10,000 fails. And if you take all of the triple C rated projects in the world, then one in four fails. So let's not spend this mountain of money very fast on the projects that fail, but rather on ensuring that more projects contributing to sustainable development and to climate action uh, actually succeed. That is where the focus needs to be. And to help more projects succeed, and Nick Stern was referring to that, we need to have a, a much better understanding of the barriers that stand in the way of success. And I would roughly put those barriers into three categories. Um, barriers that relate to risk and the perceived risk associated with many of the good things that we're trying to do. The second bucket is rate of return. If you're trying to do something new and innovative, often the return isn't great or not as great as something which is maybe a little bit less green. And a third, not to be underestimated problem, relates to size of market or, or size of project. Um, I'm sure this doesn't apply to the World Bank. I'm sure this does not apply to the Asian Development Bank either. But I have run into many financiers who are basically not interested in putting money into anything smaller than $50 million because the transaction cost is simply too high. And if you're trying to off-grid electrify a small village somewhere here in India, making that cost $50 million is quite complicated. So we need to address the, the scale of projects. So trying to understand much, in order to lift more projects into feasibility, to make them bankable, as Lord Stern was saying on, let's concentrate on issues around risk, rate of return, and size of market. But in that context, let's also not forget, and this would be my plea for today, let's not forget to think about how we define value. The, the fact of the matter today is that we list the value of a company, certainly the value of a listed company, only, solely, in terms of the cash that it returns to shareholders. That's how we measure success. And at the same time, many academics tell us, and I'm sure that Laurence works with, with many of them, that actually about 80% of the value of many companies is off balance sheet. It doesn't figure in that equation. All of the accounting is around financial capital, but what we don't measure as effectively is manufactured capital, social capital, human capital, natural capital. In other words, all of the value that a corporate is creating in society, or a significant part of the value that a corporate is creating in society, at this moment in time is not being expressed by those corporates because it's not really valued by, um, by the investors, except maybe as a risk instrument. And it's not being valued by the, by the, it's not being expressed by the corporates and not being recognized sufficiently by the investors because the regulators are not asking the investors to take it into account and they're not asking the corporates to express it. So my plea in this story of, about finance, in this story around scale, speed, and impact, my plea would be let's not forget impact. Let's focus on impact. Let's focus on how we can express the value uh, of positive action towards the sustainable development goals more holistically, because then 
because then SDG implementation becomes our measure of success rather than the amount of money being the measure of success. Thank you. Thank you, Ivo. I, th I think the emphasis on impact is, of course, the most critical one. I mean, speed and scale it happens to be also very important because as, we, as I talk to my friends in the IPCC, the, the issue between, I, I don't think it's that we, we need both. We need, in a sense, impact happening at the same time, and we're looking for innovations that allow us to get scale and speed at the same time as we, of course, don't lose sight of the impact. Why? Because the, the whole issue is about urgency is because we've just, we have, the clock is ticking. We've got about the next decade is, to me at least, talking to all my science friends and all the, all the colleagues, they're really giving us about 10 years of a good effort. If we miss this 10 years, the curves look really uh, not, uh, it'll lead us into a world where we don't want to be. And uh, the challenge that we face from the financial sector, and we're all, in a sense, representatives of the financial sector, and therefore we, 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 have, we, are, we are worried. As financial sector, we are used to keeping intact capital for 500 years. That's what financial systems do. Financiers, they don't go taking risk unnecessarily because that's not their job. Their job is to preserve wealth and their job is to preserve institutions that last 200 years. My problem as, a, as working where I do, which is interfacing between the world as I see it, the science and the challenge that we see as financing, is I, we need to close this gap between the 10-year science that is telling us the 1.5 degrees report that you've all read and the ones that we as financiers are, financiers are, are in, intimately risk averse. That's the business of being a financier. You don't become an ADB banker by taking on risk. So, and that's a challenge to Preeti because we are absolutely delighted to have Preeti here. And she, she, she comes to us with, she is the, right now the director for climate change and disaster risk management of the, uh, of the Sustainable Development Climate Change Department, that's a long name, of the Asian Development Bank, and she also serving as the ch uh, Chief of Climate Change and Disaster Risk Thematic Group. So, Preeti, you've been with us many times, and we're delighted that you're here, and of course, you're a Terry alumni, and that's a great pleasure to have you here. Your floor. Thank you, Mr. Das Gupta. It is like a homecoming for me. And uh, coming last in the panel, I think uh, all my esteemed colleagues have said all that they have had to. But whatever I've learned on climate finance is from my former boss who's sitting right here, Ivo de Boer. And it was a pleasure bringing climate finance to the fore with him at the UNFCCC Secretariat negotiation. So thank you, Ivo, for being a very good teacher. And I'm sure you will not agree with all that I say just now, but that's part of the learning process with you as well. While Ivo and some of the others have um, highlighted the importance of impact as uh, from the title of this uh, of this particular panel, I would like to go back to scale and the adequacy of financing uh, that is required to meet the challenge. Mr. Das Gupta talked about the IPCC report, the special report on 1.5 degrees, where it is talking about, you know, investments on the order of $2.4 trillion only in the energy sector to be able to hold temperatures below 1.5 degrees. And if you look at the reality of climate finance that is flowing, uh, which is of the order of around 470 uh, billion, you can already see the gap. So it's, it's not an either or story. It is, uh, we need the scale, we need the speed, and we have to ensure there is impact. And if you look at the financing that is flowing, bulk of it is domestic resources, domestic private resources. So 
Hence, you know, John, my colleague John talked about private sector mobilization. The role of private sector is quintessential, but to be able to mobilize the private sector, you need the enabling environment to be provided uh, by the governments across the world. So scale, adequacy, domestic resource mobilization, I think are very, very important elements of climate financing to meet the challenge that IPCC has set out for us. In terms of what ADB is doing on climate financing, uh, we have adopted a three-pronged approach. For us, uh, we are seeing uh, the importance of concessional financing, not only concessional financing from our own windows, such as the Asian Development Fund, but also concessional financing from multilateral funds, such as the Green Climate Fund, and climate investment funds that are being managed out of the World Bank. And much of our portfolio of investments uh, has been, um, has been uh, encouraged, I would say, by the concessional financing that we were able to deploy in our countries. And that provided the sweetener for greater climate action to take place through our investments. So that's the first part of our strategy. The second part of our strategy is mobilizing markets. And over here, we may have been a late comer to the green bonds market, but uh, ADB has something to the tune of $5 billion in green bonds. And that has been a success story, which even the World Bank has, uh, has really uh, you know, uh, undertaken for mobilizing um, uh, capital markets for green and climate action. Apart from that, I think we seem to be uh, forgetting the role of carbon markets. Uh, Evo, again, this was something that you were quite uh, intimately involved in. Uh, we are looking forward to the second generation of carbon markets. I know in Katowice we didn't come out with the entire rules for, for carbon markets, but at ADB we are quite bullish about what the role of carbon markets could be in the future and how we can support our developing member countries uh, anti anticipate and be ready to tap funding from, from, from the carbon markets. The third most important element of our strategy on climate finance, of course, relates to our private sector investments. And bulk of our clean energy investments, about one third of them have been through our private sector operations uh, in countries across the Asia Pacific. So our three pronged strategies is deploying concessional finance, mobilizing markets, be it through green bonds or through carbon markets. And third is uh, through the private sector. In ADB's recently approved strategy for 2030, we have made a further commitment, again, like the World Bank and like other MDBs, on, on our climate action. We have committed that uh, by 2030, 75% of our portfolio of projects would be integrating climate mitigation and adaptation. And cumulatively, by 2030, uh, we hope to do 80 billion in climate financing, which would be about 30% of ADB's own resources uh, directed towards climate action in the Asia Pacific region. Um, having said that, in terms of how we are measuring impact, um, Laurence talked about importance of transparency and disclosure. Um, and within the MDBs, um, we may have healthy competition, but in recent years, we have developed a very healthy partnership also in terms of reporting on our climate financing. And we have at COP24 also together made a commitment on to show how our portfolio would be aligned to the Paris Agreement. And 2019 is going to be an important year for us to develop the met metrics and methodology so that a year down the line, we as a collective of MDBs can show in a very transparent manner how we are contributing to the implementation of the Paris Agreement by supporting investments in our developing member countries. Thank you. Thank you, Preeti. I, I'll pick up the starting point of Preeti's uh, talk, and I'll ask a question around my uh, panel and see where we get to. The easy one first. I think all of them have talked in one fashion or another about getting the enabling environment right. Countries or state governments or municipalities or towns 
getting their action right in order to get the volumes of finance with high impact flowing. So I wanted to get a sense from them because I, I, I'll tell you the perspective from, because I, sit, I, I, I have sat within governments and had to deal with this problem at times when the, when, the, when the challenge came, you haven't moved your policy needle fast enough. And there are two questions that I wish to ask John Room, starting with. You know, policy change is not costless. It is incredibly costly to change policy. And I think sometimes, uh, uh, I think it's worth us, as, uh, in the sense of the financiers, having an understanding of how do you work on the political economy of change so that the changes are seen to be acceptable to people that are ultimately are going to decide whether the policy changes in the right direction or not. So I imagine what's happening in France when we see a uh, tax on uh, 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 gasoline being seen to be wrong time, wrong place. So imagine how costly it must be for uh, countries uh, such as ours or elsewhere. So the, my question for John Room is, Enabling, and the second part of it is, uh, are we underestimating the extent of the challenge that governments are willing to take on, but they, does it come with the assurance of the finance that has to flow? Because if you take policy changes, and you make the big time policy changes, and the finance doesn't flow, or the investments don't happen, then that's the worst of all war. So John, any thoughts on that question of the enabling environment? Oh, well, I'm Michael. Ah. Okay. Um, new technology. So, I think clearly figuring out what policy changes are needed is important. So, there's the substantive what is the policy, and the second one is how and how you manage the um, uh, political economy of it. Just take one. You talk about Pricing, a key issue is either introducing a, a, a tax on gasoline, getting rid of fuel subsidies, pricing carbon pollution. This is one of the areas where a policy movement will clearly move us in the right direction, but you've got to manage the political economy. Our sense is that there are ways to do these things that can manage the political economy. So for example, if you remove a fossil fuel subsidy, or you put a, a tax on gasoline. Number one, you can have social safety nets so that you protect the poorest of the poor. If you introduce a carbon tax, you could follow the model that they followed in British Columbia, where you tax the carbon, but you gave a rebate back automatically to households. And you could even do it in a way that the rebate goes back to households before they even pay the increase. Now, will everybody be better off? No, but probably 70 or 80% of the people in most of these structures can be better off. So how you communicate and how you implement these kinds of policy changes are important. I think the second piece is to be very clear and transparent on the analytics of what a policy change can do. And as you say, for the private sector to then say, under these circumstances, we will enter. So I think coming up with a, a set of policy reforms that are sort of designed in an ivory tower without consultation, for example, with people that are going to bid on renewable energy projects is a recipe for disaster. I mentioned the, this Madhya Pradesh project, which is very successful here in, in India. One of the reasons it was so successful in structuring the power purchase agreement, they spent a lot of time consulting very closely with potential bidders. And so the mechanisms and instruments that were put inside that power purchase agreement were very well tested beforehand. So they had a very high degree of confidence that when implemented, you would get the financial uh, response. It was not theor theology, it was not ivory tower, but very targeted to the finances. So without, uh, uh, I'm going to do something which I normally wouldn't do. But I'd, I'll ask the audience to put up their hands. Did you agree with what John Room just told you? Put up your hand, who, those who agree. So I'd say we've got about one third agreement, John, with what he proposed. So that's the state of the world. Imagine that you wa walked in with that same story. 
into President Macron's office and he told him, you know, you did all the right things, but it's costly. So, some, this, this, uh, so all I wish to add is that we need to work away at this question of the enabling environment. But I want to turn a little bit to the domestic side and ask Mr. Dave the same question. So you work with the states and union territories and you see uh, differences between one state, one union territory uh, being in the enabling environment. But more important than the, the second thing that you talked about is budgetary resources. How do I reshape the public budgets to allocate more resources to the impacts that Evo wants to see on the ground happening? And why do you think some state governments, is there a lesson there that you draw from where you sit in Nabad that you can walk into the chief minister's offices and tell them, look, sir or madam, this state did it better for this reason and that reason. Why should they do what you're saying to them? I'll just give an example of uh, the infrastructure funding that we are doing. Like NABARD supports almost 20% of rural infrastructure in India on annualized basis. Now, take the case of irrigation and water management. You distinctly find few states which are very aggressive on efficiency, bringing efficiency on water use management. Madhya Pradesh. Madhya Pradesh is now talking of prepaid water cards to be given to the farm water user association. Okay. So if you want to draw the money, or draw the water, you have to first get your water card recharged and then to the extent of you know, what you have charged, you get the water. Now this is a policy initiative where it is being stated that the, under every irrigation project, there will be, the command area will be necessarily put on water efficient resources, the investment. Logically things are happening. Now when we do a national level best practices seminar on infrastructure, we bring people from different walks of life in state government and saying that this is how Gujarat has done and this is how Madhya Pradesh has done and you correlate with the agriculture growth story of those states, it's fantastic. And does it work? And it does work. And people okay. do pick up ideas and say that next year, in my state budget, these are the three new changes which we are going to bring about. Thank you, thank you. I, I think, uh, so we can talk about this <coughs> enabling policy, but the lesson I think the panel as a whole, I think we all agree that uh, if, if we want to do this 10 year period change that we're looking at, the next decade, and it's a critical transition point that's, that somehow we have to do a better job at working with the policy, political policy makers as to what is feasible politically on their side and do sometimes less than the first best. Sometimes it'll be <coughs> not necessarily going to <coughs> the most efficient prices, but maybe there'll be some other answers to where. So I think the panel as a whole, we share that enabling policy environment is a critical stepping stone to getting the increase financing and effective financing that's coming through. Now, I, I want to turn to Laura and, and ask her the <coughs> question about as she sees it. Um, nevertheless, nevertheless, suppose we had the enabling policy conditions in place. The problem is that the size of investments that we need is around $6.78 trillion from six studies going beyond what Nick Stern just talked about, the 90 trillion, it's actually slightly more. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's about 100 trillion dollars a year between now <coughs> and 2035. It's a lot of resources uh, that we have, to, and we are far from reaching it, and that's the total size. And we are still struggling with 100 billion dollars a year, which is a subset, as Nick said, of that larger total. So, we can't, there, there are two models in which we can try and bridge that gap. One model is public investment itself, which is governments investing more, which is public money investing more. And I think all of us agree public money investing more is a great idea, but it's not going to bridge that gap. It's going to come from the private sector and financial markets one way or another. So the question I had for you is, 
how do we take that limited public resources and public money that we have in budgets? Very tight. <coughs> All governments across the world are tight. I can't tell you the kind of debates that happen within Ministry of Finance when you come with a proposal saying you want to spend an additional million dollars. And it's a tough proposal. And environment and climate, they always worry. So my question for you uh, is, for every euro or rupee that we spend in public resources, how can we get the leverage out of the private investment? And what's the right leverage factor that we should be aiming for? And how should we do it? What's the instrument? Because I don't want to be building the next N plus one public investment, because that's a one for one. I'm not getting anything more out of it. I want a one for 15, one for 20. And Evo tells me at some points, he's done five for 95. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> One, I think, anyway, going from the one, the, the ratio of one on four or five, we have on many sort of intention to leverage the private sector to even a factor 10 would be just good because we are not there by far. And, and I think uh, that was, I was referring to the notion of the chain. One, of course, as Lord Stern said and you said, we need, of course, a massive increase of investment. But this investment will take place. And the problem is where we put that money. Do we put that money in building more coal power plants, more, more roads, more highways, which may, anyway, we may need? Um, or, or we go in the, in the other direction. Do we put a lot of effort in energy, energy efficiency, or we build more homes without being them efficient? So it's really a matter of choices. And that, which is true, is no one can do the choice, make the choice alone. Again, on the leveraging issue, for the moment, it's a, like uh, a scene where uh, it's a little bit of a drama. You have the public sector saying, we want to leverage, and then the private sector saying, oh, it's so risky. I heard, I will not give names, but even institutional investors telling that investing in renewable energy these days is risky. Come on. Look at the condition in India, in Chile, in, in Europe. It's not a risky investment. It's a, the way the system is functioning. So I think there is, we need a, a transparent and honest conversation between if really uh, all these public investment go in the right direction, an honest conversation on what really the risks are. And that's why I insist on the long-term perspective. We can't have a, a, a changing of expectation of the private sector side and, and, and then a much better leverage ratio if the private investor doesn't see where, where is the direction going. That's why we need really a clear vision of the long-term type of development the, the country wants and the governments want and the, all the actors in the country want. And this is the signal, I think, that will help the investors say, well, we understand that the fossil fuel-based economy is just the past. And they are not sure for the moment. They are not sure. That's why you see all this mixed signal from different reasons. Of course, we need these subsidies on the fossil fuel to disappear progressively. It's still 600 million. Uh, it's, it's a lot every year. Uh, and that comes to what John and, and you said on the social acceptability. To be frank, and again, I'm not anymore in the government, so I can be frank about the French situation. You know, it was mostly a management issue of the carbon tax. When you look at the debate which is taking place now in France, nobody talks about uh, ecological transition. People agree on that. The problem is the way it is prepared, informed, again, uh, compensated in some cases. Uh, and if there are alternatives to be offered, you can't put a carbon tax and say, uh, forget. We, you, you have to manage if there is no public transport, if there is no uh, very low carbon emissions cars. That's your problem. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I think it's a problem of sequence on the policy. Uh, and I think we can make a lot of progress. British Columbia, of Thanks. course, is a very good example. But even we can have other examples of that. But I think legitimately I would like, I would love to have this honest conversation between the private investors and the MDBs on what is a reasonable 
risk perception. Because I think for the moment it's really confused and not really totally serious. And finally, I think that's why I insist on the long-term perspective. Uh, but we now we have a vision even of the cost of technology over, over the 10 or 15 years. You take the, Japan, the Japanese model on the costing of technology, they, they, and that's the way they work with our, their own private sector. They just are able to, in a way, set targets on the technology, on renewable energy, on the hydrogen cars, etc. That's something I think we should engage in that conversation. But that's why the short term, the, we will not solve this with a short term vision. It's not possible. There is too much past dependency. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I think this, uh, this notion of a honest and frank conversation is so crucial. I, I think uh, it resonates with what, what, what I sense is the situation in India as well. For example, we've just had this huge debate about air quality, worsening air quality all across uh, the cities in the Indo-Gangetic Plain and beyond. And of course, the budget just, uh, the interim budget just went through and air quality doesn't figure greatly in it. And it's, it's, it's part of a process of, so therefore, it's part of a process of, uh, of frank and honest conversations and engaging with the public, engaging with the community at large. We can't be in ivory towers, nor can we tell governments what to do. Governments do what they have to do, and we have to find a way. So, Ivo, you suggested all the triple C projects fail. And my, my fascination is if we, I don't want a 100% success story. I mean, if we, if we are trying to go for a 100% success story in climate change, we are in, in trouble. We will only get those projects that are uh, uh, gold line. And I know your heart is in trying to get those triple C projects to do a little bit better. So what do you think we should be, uh, how should we challenge ourselves to improve the bankability and the success story of the smaller projects and the riskier projects, uh, and, and so that bankers feel comfortable with bankable projects. Any, any, any thoughts? Sure, do you want the three hour answer or the? Yeah, uh, but the <laughs> <laughs> I think the audience is ready for a three hours, but I think. Uh, no, I won't do that to you, but yeah. I, I, let me give just a couple of examples. Um, one of the other things I'm, I'm involved in at the moment is, um, I sit on an organization that, that, on the board of an organization, that every year gets 80 million euros from the European Commission to spend on climate innovation. And the way this organization spends its money is by uh, investing in the ideas of startups, in, in helping bright ideas through the valley of death, in getting bright ideas to the point where other investors are willing to, to pick them up. So thinking about early stage, uh, investment yeah. in early stage innovation is, is, is one aspect. The, the second aspect, and, and this is the one that, that I tried to, to highlight, um, is, is what can we do to express the value of a project, whether it's triple A or triple C, uh, more holistically. Okay. At, at the moment, we're in the situation where really only, um, only finance counts, where we don't look at broader value creation, even though we know, as I said, that 80% of the value of a company is off balance sheet. We don't recognize that when, uh, generally, we're, when we make an investment. And that, I think, can dramatically change the attractiveness of, uh, of, uh, of a proposal. And thirdly, it's the last one I'll mention, in, in the area of, of, of regulation, there are so many things that we can do to encourage or force the expression of value most, more holistically. We get many, many wonderful things from the United States, and one of the wonderful things that we got from the United States was the 2008 financial crisis. Um, <laughs> as a result of the 2008 financial crisis, the regulators, uh, the investment regulators, the finance ministers went through a process called Basel IV, which basically forced investors, including pension funds, to be even more risk averse, which meant that they started doing even less on sustainability because that was perceived to be high risk. So let's look in the domain of the, the regulator around things which, which I would argue cost nothing. What can you do as a regulator to encourage investors to be more sustainable in what they do and to recognize the value of sustainability? What can you do as a regulator to force or encourage corporates to express their contribution to society as part of their reporting 
not just how much cash they give back to, uh, to shareholders. And finally, on the earlier question that, that you asked somebody else, um, in, in my country, um, it was the question around, around government spending. In my country, 20% of, of, of all procurement is public procurement. Mm -hmm. I, somebody told me in a panel yesterday that 30% of, uh, of all procurement in India is, uh, is public. And there are incredibly strong signals that you can send through the nature of, of public procurement. Um, yes. I had, and I'll end with that, an incident once where we were trying to get house decorators, painters, off oil-based paint um, in, in our country. And the, the decorators said it's impossible. We can, it'll drip off the walls. We can only work with oil-based paint. So we said, fine. As of today, the government is only going to work with painters and decorators who are qualified in working with water-based paint. And since we were buying 20% of the paint, we shifted the whole market. Thank you. Thanks, Ivo. So we've, the panel's agreed so far, and I'm going to close. We're getting too close to close the time. The panel's agreed so far we need a policy-enabling policy environment, but do it with sensitivity to the political economy and how to manage the costly political processes. The panel's also agreed with the idea that have frank and honest conversations, especially on budgets, and make it much more transparent, as Ivo says, get the story out into the citizens, because citizens have to decide at the end of the day how, how fast and how fast they wish to go. We've talked about state government budgets. So to you, Preeti, my last question on this is uh, ADP rightly very proud of mobilizing markets. And we've seen a huge convergence around the world taking place. Actually, our role will disappear, and the private sector will know what it has to do increasingly. So that's great. The, the best of all worlds is where ADB and World Bank and us, we don't need to do it. The private sector goes and does the things that are profitable and impressive to take. So my, my question to you is, what remains to be done? What are the gaps be getting? Because essentially, the global financial market size is around $400 trillion. Mm -hmm. So the number that I gave you at the beginning of about $6.78 trillion in spending that we need to tweak to be climate friendly is not very large relative to the assets that we have in place. And mobilizing markets, therefore, is a trick. <coughs> it's a kind of, you know, do you want to be invested in fossil fuels? Be my guest. More transparency will show you how risky it is. Do you want to be in the right areas? And yes, they would. So, What's holding us back from getting the pension funds and mobilizing markets, as Ivo says? What's holding that? Any, any thoughts? I, I, <coughs> to my mind, it, it is what, what are the signals we are giving to the markets uh, in terms of what criteria they need to follow. Some of it could be top down, as Ivo talked about, the paints market um, in, in the Netherlands. And some of it could be related to incentivizing incentivizing investments in the <coughs> right directions. And therein, again, I think the role of the government comes in to direct those flows. I think Mr. Dawi also talked about greening uh, the banking sector. You know, to what extent, uh, with our little min money that MDBs are providing, what kind of financial intermediation loans are building in those criteria for greening and climate-friendly investments, which could, again, then leverage you know, the commercial banks. So it, it's a... It's a question of providing the right kind of signaling, I think, uh, that is important to, to move the needle. Excellent. I, I, I think uh, let's, uh, let's conclude this session. Thank you to the panelists for a wonderful uh, conversation that we had. And I, and I hope we push the envelope a little bit further towards having a frank and honest conversation about these issues. And I thank the audience for having listened to us on a late afternoon on something as boring as this. Thanks. Ah, a photo. <laughs> <laughs>